when we were planning this event, uh, we were all meeting the different speakers, and we wanted to go through what the various messages in the different presentations were going to be about, and what we hoped that you guys would go home doing afterwards. What we hoped that the main messages and the main inspiration that we could give you to start um, doing things di differently or feeling more confident about what you were already doing when you got back home from our morning here together. And during that meeting, I was listening to the different presenters, and we were coming through all these various sources of inspiration and knowledge, and the knowledge kept sort of piling up. And then at some point, Runa was saying, um, you know, if I had known all, the, all that I know now in the beginning, I would never have dared to do anything. Maybe this wasn't what he said, but this is what I heard. And then that sort of reminded me of this challenging dilemma that we often have in innovation project and in design project. On the one hand, the challenge is huge. You want to add all this new knowledge, the radical curiosity that we need to solve the problems that Sinna has been talking about today. On the other hand, we know that being an innovator is so much to do with courage and passion and conviction and vision, and that that courage, I like that, the metaphor that the courage is like a muscle, it needs to be exercised to grow, like you have to go out there and, and do it. And in that dilemma, standing on that scale somehow, I know where I put my bet on the individual, in the person, in the human, that are standing there in every situation knowing if it's the one or the other, and weighing the options. And that's what my talk to you today is going to be about. It's all about the people. It's all about unleashing creative powers. Frank, I'm following you. I'm going to try here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to share three stories with you today. Three stories about implementation. Three stories about... Wow, this was a very different perspective. Is it better for you if I'm standing up here? Is it? Okay, better than here? I think it's better here. I can sort of... I feel you more now. Okay, I have to ask you this question. How many of you come from an um, organization with one person? If you think about like your home organization, are you one? Then I want you to stand up. Nope. Are you uh, 10 people in your organization? Like less than 10? Cool. Okay. Thank you. Are you uh, less than 50? Yeah? Great. Uh, okay. Let's take a big one. Are you more than 100? Right. You know, look at that. Have a look around. You're more than 100. Okay, are you more than 500? Right. You know, thank you. Oh, okay, I'm not going to continue. But did you feel how that, this idea that we talk about stories about individual creativity, isn't that sort of interesting when you know that you have to go home? And I don't know how like, inspired you feel by yourself. Here, I can get pretty inspired. I'm like, woohoo, those are really interesting things to start do working on. But then you have to implement it and do it together with 500 more people. 100 more people. That's where creativity is going to be implemented in some of our huge corporations. OK, this is what my stories are about. Three stories. Um, a long time ago, I worked in Lego, in Lego company. Billun, toy producer, Denmark. Um, Lego wanted to raise the bar of innovation, and they started this sort of internal future studies institute. I was part of a team that uh, was cross-disciplinary. We picked from various fields, and we were procedure-wise supposed to be in the very beginning of the stage gate model. In other words, we were supposed to really challenge the what we knew when we started innovating. Lego 
is Lego. It means that they can pick like really the best creative brains from around the world, and they are working on play, learning, and creativity. I don't know how many of you feel like that is a little bit what Elena was about. Like, this is really important stuff. We're working with learning and the difference in family structures from around the world. I don't know. It ticked up on a lot of my really important things that I thought was really interesting to work on. I basically thought that I had the dream job, except that I didn't. And the reason I didn't wasn't because it wasn't the best company, because they are. And it wasn't because I didn't have the best colleagues, because I did. <coughs> But at the same time as I was running around preaching innovation, talking about paradigm shifts and changes in technology, at the same time as we were exploring like, organizational interventions and new ways of working, at the same time, my colleagues were getting fired. People were losing their jobs. Right? It was happening right at the same time. And some people think that innovation sort of is fueled by fear. Like, I'm not one of those. Um, and what we as a team learned, I think, was that uh, you might have the greatest concepts and the most clever arguments The research, I mean, Lego work with the best academic institutions from around, so like the best founded work. But if you don't have people on board, nothing happens. It took me a long time to sort of make sense of that experience, I must say because we thought we had everything we needed. We had buy-in at the top of their organization. You will have pl hear plenty of speeches this week, I think, about that. Uh, and there was like this really grounded work being done. And just at the time we were really starting adding value, no, we s let's stop doing this work. And I, when I tried to make sense of it many years afterwards, the time when this story comes up, is one, when people tell me everything that they're missing to actually do innovation, that we think all these various things have to be in place and then it would happen. And I'm thinking everything was in place, except people weren't on board. And if you can make people being on board, so much can be done. Just so much can be done. And the second part of that, that uh, the second thing that I think you can take away from that story is something about the ambiguity of organizations, of the big organizations. We like innovation stories that are sort of simple, I think. We all love simple, of course we do. We like things that have like a simple protagonist, and of course there are challenges. Sure, we've heard challenges, but, but they are sort of external and we will go through, and we will win, and then we will make it in the end. But the organizations that many of you are working in, they are filled with contradictory decisions, they are filled with so much, yeah, let me just say ambiguity. There's so many reasons for why things are happening. And I think if we don't start saying, talking more lo loudly about that, or having a language for that, then talking about implementation is going to be really, really difficult. Story number two. Much, no, yeah, much more recently, here at Eggs Design, I work with um, design-driven innovation, and we, I think I forgot to say that, but yeah, I do. <laughs> and we work uh, with Nordea Life, Nordea Liv, which is the um, insurance and pension part company that shares name with the bank. Um, and at the beginning of the year, or well, they have like lots of institutions in that, in that um, field these days, huge ambitions when it comes to digital, uh, digitalization. And I think, I know that some of you are sitting around here knowing that field very well. 
Um, and they, had, they knew so much about what they wanted from technology. But the team that they established called, was called DigiLife, and the project that we were working on is called DigiLife. And they want a completely new way of approaching their clients and their customers. But what, and what happened when they established the team was that they worked really well with it. They picked like, great people from around the organization who would know how to make the business transformation happen. And at Eggs, we sort of entered the project from a really sort of classical service design perspective. We worked with service design, and there was this big service design project going on. But while we were working, step by step, we started feeling this sense that there was something, there was some sort of dissonance there. And I think Nordea knew it, but we had to learn it. Then, because when we started developing and coming up with ideas and running brainstorming sessions, the content that came out of it was sort of analog. Can you recognize that? Like, we were saying digitalization, we were saying technology, we were saying complete new customer journeys, but somehow it seemed as if it was mirroring a physical world onto screens. And what happened was that Nordea, at the same time as they were doing this service design project, was running a parallel project that we were starting to get involved in, which was the learning journey for the team involved. The learning journey to increase the digital literacy, you might say, and the digital culture that was happening, that was present in the organization, because not only, did they need, not only do we need the new solutions, not only do we need the new touch points, but obviously, we need the lift in the organization to be able to support that, to take over where the technology ends. In this project, they've done it really pretty cleverly, I would say, because they have actually established a parallel learning structure. I'm going to say that once more. The parallel learning structure. It's the big, org it's the big project, but then it's also the learning project that goes along on the side, where we pick up the issues that are, is happening because of the lack of literacy or competence. And we work with the sort of ambiguity and the reflections that is coming up. And it's a, it's a pretty, um, it's an actual practice in itself. And um, earlier today, you were, th you were hearing Kahneman. You were hearing about system one and system two, thinking fast, thinking slow. And that is exactly what we're trying to address there. We're trying to address going into a system two way of thinking, because that's what you need if you want to lift. You can't operate from the same way of thinking, trying to do something that new as their ambition level is on. OK. Story three. The third story that I want to share with you comes from a completely different actor again. It's Avinur, so it's Oslo Airport, the new Oslo Airport. How many of you have landed or fled from the new airport yet? Yep. Cool. Did it work well? Oh, I'm not going to start that conversation, because what Avinur says is that, the, is that the implementation of the new airport is a success. They made it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they actually managed to make the biggest land-based um, um, building structure project happen in Norway's history at the same time as they were running an airport. That's pretty impressive, I think. They were running this airport, us flying in and out, we had no idea probably what was going on behind the scenes, at the same time as they were building this inter new terminal and implementing lots of new technology, lots of new systems, lots of new procedures. Eggs had a part in that project in this very small part of this humongous project, which was about learning for the employer, employees. Because what Avinur knew was that this was all about the people. And I learned the phrase, it's all about the people, from Avinur. And I will keep repeating it here today, it's all about the people. And they said that 
we can have the best technology, we can have the coolest, they are winning architectural awards for the beautiful, beautiful uh, new terminal. But if our employees are not ready to put this into action, then our customer satisfac satisfaction will go down. And actually, they didn't only hold, want the customer satisfaction to stay, they wanted the sat customer satisfaction to go up with a new ter terminal, obviously. But as most of you know, there's often a performance drop in these sort of changes. And that's what they wanted to work against. And they did that by creating learning programs, onboarding programs, physical, digital, um, product, learning product, uh, products for, OK, hold on. 22,000 people. Um, we were involved in the part of, of designing learning for 12,000 employees for 88 different employers. I'm not saying this to create this sort of, ah, wow, they are great. I'm saying this to remind us when we think that we have large organizations or when, when we think that its implementation is difficult or that there's a huge like learning a uh, gap out there. Avinur took on the challenge of, ex of, of training or giving information and onboarding 22,000 people and actual physical training with lots of different products for 12,000 people just to make the airport work. And they say it's all about the people. Obviously, it's not all about the people. But it's all about the people in the sense that people is the X factor that will make or break this implementation. People are the ones that can make it fail, or people are the ones that can take this just to new levels of innovation that we haven't even imagined. And that is sort of when I end up thinking, ah, how much of our potential do we leave at home when we go to work in the morning? How much of our brains do we leave at the door? No. Um, but I think that there's a lot of unleashed creative powers out there. And since we at Eggs have this sort of as a mantra, I want to share that with you as a final note, because I strongly believe we are all leaders, not in the formal sense, but we are leaders in the sense that I spend, I share my time leading myself, leading the people on my team, leading my colleagues, and leading my leaders. And so do you, all the time. And on that note, I want to leave you with two final questions. What are you doing right now to unleash more of your creative powers? And what are you doing to help unleash more of the creative powers of the people around you? Thank you. Thank you, Lena.